Hello, welcome to the Deep Learning at Scale tutorial at SC20. My name is Steve Farrell. I'm from NERSC at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Today, in this tutorial, you will learn how to effectively deploy deep learning applications to HPC systems. We're going to help you learn about performance optimization, particularly on NVIDIA GPUs, best practices for scaling to multiple GPUs and nodes, talk about some scientific application examples, and help you learn about hyperparameter optimization and how to deploy those kinds of workloads. We are not going to cover in depth the basics of deep learning today. However, uh, we will provide some links and resources for introductory material that you can follow up on if that's your interest. Uh, we've done this tutorial a few times now, including two previous years at Supercomputing. And in past years, we have been able to provide hands-on uh, examples with training accounts on our Cori supercomputer. Uh, but due to the constraints of this year, uh, we decided we're not going to be able to do that. But we will provide still code examples, as well as do some live demos, um, which then you can take and, and, uh, and use on your own systems. So we're going to have examples and demos for doing the um, performance analysis and profiling, for how to do distributed training, and uh, for how to do hyperparameter tuning with the Cray HPO tool. This is the team of organizers and presenters putting together this material today. At NERSC, besides uh, myself, there's Wahid Benji and Mustafa Mustafa. From NVIDIA, we have Josh Romero and Torsten Kurt. And from HPE, we have Mike Ringenberg and Ben Albrecht. This is the agenda for today. So we're in the introduction right now from me. After this, we're going to go through a live uh, example code walkthrough on the, the PyTorch uh, model and, and uh, training code that we're going to be using today. After that, the NVIDIA guys are going to talk for a little bit about performance optimization and profiling, and then switch to a live demo uh, to demonstrate the use of some profiling tools. Then we'll have a break, and after the break, Mustafa will tell us about uh, best practices for scaling deep learning, and then after that, we're going to have another live demo demonstrating how to do distributed training with the example code. And then we'll finish off the tutorial with Mike's talk about hyperparameter optimization with some examples um, using the Cray HPO tool. So as I said, we're not going to go in depth into the basics of deep learning today, but here are a few links which you may find useful. The first one is a link to our tutorial material from last year at SC19. We did have a talk and some examples more tailored to introducing deep learning. Um, and also we had hands-on examples specifically in Keras uh, and Horovod. So today we're using PyTorch if you prefer to learn or um, uh, wish to learn additionally about Keras and Horovod, then you can go check out that material. At Berkeley Lab, for the past couple of years, we've been doing a deep learning for science school. So last year in 2019, we had an in-person week-long event and quite a bit of lectures related to introduction to machine learning and deep learning. Uh, you can watch the videos online. They're on YouTube there. You can follow, follow this link. Uh, this year in 2020, we had a webinar series instead. Um, there was one talk, which was introduction to PyTorch, which you may find useful, and then quite a bit of additional advanced topics. So um, again, I encourage you to check these out if you're interested. And beyond this, of course, there are many other great resources for learning deep learning online, many of which are completely free. If you need help um, getting other recommendations for resources, uh, you should feel free to reach out to us separately. So I'll do a little bit of review, hopefully review, on some deep learning concepts. So deep learning is, of course, a very powerful set of tools for solving problems. Um, we are um, certainly in the middle of what you might call an AI revolution, uh, and, and a lot of that's because of um, the rise of deep learning. And um, AI and deep learning are um, you know, transforming big tech companies from the ground up as they work into every part of their business. 
but also deep learning is working its way into many, many recent technologies, many of which we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. For example, the way our phone understands what we say, how we search the internet, increasingly the way we get around with things like self-driving cars, um, deep learning applications are starting to show promise in healthcare, and of course many other things, including some fun stuff like arts and games. So deep learning is the subset of machine learning that's powered by deep neural networks. And of course, deep neural networks are highly parameterized uh, function approximators, basically with very high expressive capability. Um, it's basically a new way to write programs. Uh, it's been referred to as software 2.0, where instead of writing programs by hand in some language like C++, we define this uh, this complex uh, function, and then we have data where we try to now uh, fit that function to data to learn some functional mapping of inputs to outputs. Now, this uh, rise of deep learning is very much driven by things like the availability of GPUs and large curated data sets. So um, it's, it's, it's no big secret that uh, that deep learning does very well and can do better than traditional machine learning techniques when you have a sufficient amount of data. And if you look at the, the history of the ImageNet competition, it was around 2012 and 2013 when deep learning started to take off and the error rates started to go down dramatically, which is about the same time that uh, GPUs started to be used to train these models. Of course, since that time, the field has really taken off and there's been um, many great achievements and developments and applications of deep learning to many different types of problems. But deep learning is not only useful for industry use cases. Deep learning can be, and in fact, is transforming science workflows as well. That's because deep neural networks have powerful capabilities that are relevant for science. Things like their ability to automatically learn patterns from high dimensional data, or to encode inductive biases and symmetries. Our science data often has structure and symmetries that we want to incorporate into our models. Some of the emerging promising application areas of deep learning for science include analysis of large scientific data sets. Um, as more telescopes and particle accelerators are coming online or being upgraded, the amount of science data out there, the data sets are growing, getting more complex. And uh, deep learning has shown promise at being able to automatically um, do analysis of large data without using the handwritten um, analysis pipelines or without uh, manual human analysis or sifting through data. Um, another thing is that often in science we have very expensive but high fidelity simulations in order to, to do calculations to solve problems. And there's a lot of excitement around deep learning's capabilities to accelerate this with generative models and other kinds of things. The third one is in real-time control and design of experiments. So whether you are trying to tune the parameters of a particle accelerator beam or control a, um, a scanning microscope or uh, control the routing of data through a high-speed network, um, the ability to do this automatically with deep learning and perhaps do it in a smarter way than a human might or faster way, um, this is a potential game changer. So uh, adoption of deep learning is on the rise in the scientific communities. They are definitely very enthusiastic. Um, every day there are more and more papers being published on science applications of deep learning. Um, there's a growing presence at conferences. Uh, including the, the machine learning conferences such as NeurIPS, where paper submissions and attendance popularity is basically soaring, uh, but also in the domain science conferences where we see more and more submissions and dedicated tracks for machine learning and deep learning. There's been recognition of achievements in deep learning with awards like the Turing Award and Gordon Bell Prize. The Department of Energy and other funding agencies are investing heavily in AI and deep learning. There have been several funding calls related to AI for science, um, last year we had an AI for Science town hall series in the national labs. There were over a thousand attendees across um, uh, four of these meetings. And that culminated in this 300 page report on AI for Science, which you can now go and read, which uh, talks about all the, the challenges, the grand challenges and capabilities. 
So now um, I, I can't talk about you know everything that's going on in deep learning for science, but I'm just going to briefly highlight a handful of examples, some of which were uh, done at NERSC or with um, our collaborators and colleagues at NERSC. Uh, and th these kind of show some of the interesting capabilities that you can do with deep learning for science, such as CosmoGAN, which shows the use of generative adversarial networks for um, basically learning to replace uh, cosmology simulations. These two demonstrate super resolution methods. So the kind of the theme here is that you might be able to use simulators at a coarse grained or lower resolution uh, and then use deep learning to to enhance the results to make them equivalent to higher fidelity simulators. The Exascale deep learning for climate analytics work. Uh, Torsten and Josh were co-authors on this. This shared the Gordon Bell Prize in 2018, ran um, at scale on Summit. Uh, ExatrackX project is one that I'm involved in where we look at graph neural networks for particle tracking. Uh, this is a nice example that shows in science often we have data that doesn't fit into images or sequences and maybe it has more irregular or geometric structure so we can utilize methods like graph neural networks to tackle problems. And the last one, Edda Loomis was shown at SC19 last year. Wahid was a co-author. And this is a great example of showing how you can do um, probabilistic programming with deep neural networks combined with a traditional simulator for efficient inference. And uh, also demonstrated how you can do large-scale training of this, these systems. So um, as we start to uh, tackle more complex tasks in science or wherever with bigger deep learning models and bigger data sets, the amount of compute that we need to train those models grows. And in fact, over time, it seems like the amount of compute needed to train deep learning models is growing exponentially, at least for um, some of the more popular cases here on this OpenAI plot. Um, so we're clearly in a regime where a single GPU just doesn't cut it for many deep learning problems now. So we need something like HPC systems in order to, to throw at these problems. So one example system is one that's coming online soon at NERSC, Perlmutter. That's our next generation system optimized for science. This is one of the early Cray Shasta systems. It's going to have um, a few times the capability of Cori, our current system. And we're working hard to make sure it has an optimized hardware and software stack for deep learning. Perlmutter is going to be coming in two phases. The first one late this year will have a lot of GPUs. And in fact, these NVIDIA A100 Ampere GPUs, single tier all flash storage system. Uh, and then Perlmutter will also have a Cray Slingshot High Performance Network, which comes in phase two in mid-2021. So uh, we are very excited about this system and its capabilities for deep learning. Now, we have our deep learning methods, we have our interesting science problems, and we even have HPC systems to throw at this. But how do we make sure that we make effective use of these HPC systems for our deep learning problems? Okay. So this slide details the roadmap that reflects how we're structuring the tutorial and the things we're going to go through today. So first of all, we're going to assume that we start today with uh, already a model which is appropriate for solving your science problem, which trains, let's say, on a single CPU or GPU. And so once you have something like that, which can at least learn on your, your data set to solve a problem, now we want to um, to try and scale up to use a large system for this. But before we throw, you know, hundreds or thousands of GPUs at a problem, it's of course always important to first think about how effectively you're using the single computational unit. So how you're using a single node or single GPU. So we're first going to talk about how you optimize that performance on a single GPU using the, you know, uh, profiling tools, um, showing you how to tune and optimize the data pipeline, which can often be a bottleneck and how to make effective use of the hardware with things like reduced uh, mixed precision. Okay, uh, Once you have a good handle on the single node or single GPU performance, then you can start to look at how you distribute the training across multiple GPUs, multiple nodes, um, using the right communication libraries. Um, you might want to use data parallelism or model parallelism, but today we're not going to talk really much at all about model parallelism. We're going to focus on the more common case of data parallelism and Mustafa in particular is going to talk about uh, best practices for large-scale training and convergence. And once you have all that done, um, a way to really leverage very large-scale systems is then to do many trainings at once in uh, a distributed hyperparameter optimization. So we're going to show how you can do that with tools like CrayHPO, 
which can seamlessly work with the, the schedulers on HPC systems and have sophisticated search algorithms to tune. Um, once again, just showing the agenda really quick, uh, but this is the end of the introduction, so I'll just say uh, thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the tutorial. Thank you.